Ready? Hey, good morning. Uh, where am I looking? Right here? Yeah. Okay. So good morning. Uh, my name is Carson Kayser. I am a urogynecologist here at Erlanger. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about urogynecology for the generalist, the generalist, and we're going to do some kind of new things like updates, some controversies, and then just kind of talk about some other basic urogynecology stuff. Let's see. So I have no uh, disclosures. So the objectives of this is to kind of discuss current diagnostic and treatment modalities. So basically, how do you work somebody up? How do you talk to them in the office? How can you diagnose what's going on uh, that should be in the realm of the general gynecologist? We're also going to discuss surgeries, um, kind of how to do a few things, and also controversies, topics, and then some new updates that have kind of happened over the past couple of years. Um, so when your patient comes in, when your patient comes into the office, uh, you should always be asking about lower urinary tract dysfunction. So things like urgency, frequency, you got to go to the bathroom, leaking, um, talk about pelvic support defects, like do you feel something's dropping, uh, or you have any pain, any issues with bowel movements, or even sexual dysfunction. So things to keep in mind. So, and the, the beauty of what I do is that most of what I do is really just quality of life as opposed to quantity of life. So these are all just quality of life problems. So you know, none of them are usually emergent, but they can be very bothersome. Um, they're also extremely prevalent. Like overactive bladder is actually more prevalent than diabetes, but a lot of people just don't want to talk about it. Um, and even 11%, and this is a rough number of all women in the U.S. will probably undergo some type of surgery for either prolapse or incontinence in their life. So it's really prevalent. Uh, the majority of these women just suffer in silence and they're not gonna tell you, you have to ask them. So, and the other thing that a lot of people ask is that where, how, where do these come from? What, what causes this? And we, we don't really know, we don't, we don't really understand what causes prolapse, what causes incontinence. Um, so. so, and you also have to remember that, yeah, you can take someone to the OR and fix anatomy, but that may not always correlate well function. So, you know, you can do a, an anterior repair, but they may, still, they may still be leaking. So, okay, just always remember that. Um, and there's usually significant overlap in symptoms. So very often I see people that have prolapse, they also have overactive bladder and incontinence with it, like uh, stress incontinence, like coughing, laughing, sneezing. And I see these kind of together all the time. So you really have to individualize each patient. So and before I get kind of into the next one, um, I would say that asking someone which is the most bothersome symptom is kind of the first thing that I would do um, and just kind of focusing on that first. So we're going to just talk about some basic bladder stuff and how the bladder works. So as everybody knows, it's a low pressure reservoir. The pressure should never be high in the bladder, even despite having a lot of volume. Um, it is a voluntary smooth muscle and that always confused me for a long time because I thought it was just a uh, you know, like you could say, okay, I need to pee and it would happen, but it's so most of the time that is an involuntary smooth muscle, but this is one of the only voluntary smooth muscles that we have. Um, and then you also have to understand that there is a synergy with the pelvic floor and the bladder. And so that's why we'll talk about it in a minute, like pelvic floor physical therapy is so important. So as the, the bladder is gonna have a contraction to urinate, actually the pelvic floor muscle has to relax first so that the bladder can then contract and you can have um, a normal void. So, Let's see, and can I put a, my mouse to work? Okay, good. So this is just a quick little review real fast. So this is going to be volume of uh, fluid in the bladder, and then this is going to be the pressure. So as you can see, as, as the volume begins to increase here, the pressure really just stays the same until you get up to, you know, around four or 500. So most people can hold this amount without being super uncomfortable, and this is kind of where it starts to get uncomfortable. So just know that um, it's a low pressure reservoir. And then things with um, overactive bladder, you can see someone here with the detrusor pressure, which is the pressure of the bladder. As the volume increases, uh, the pressure really should not get much higher, but these people right here, so in A, this is someone who has urgency at low volumes. And then here, you can see we're just filling this patient up, filling this patient up, filling this patient up, and they have no sensation. So really tailoring um, your treatment to each of these patients is important and really asking, like, do you always feel like you have to go? Yep. Do you always feel like you don't have to go? This would be this person right here. And so 
treatments would definitely be different for each of these people. So lower urinary tract symptoms. So that's once. So interview. So you got to understand the patient's complaints and concerns. Obviously, you have to rule on infection. It would be uh, not good if you were treating someone for overactive bladder and they end up just having a UTI the whole time. And then a big part of what I do every day is just saying, is this stress incontinence or is this urge? So do you laugh, you know, do you laugh, cough, and sneeze, and that's when you leak? Or is it because you're running to the bathroom and you can't hold it? Or maybe it's mixed, maybe it's both of these. And then there's also the, the one that gets missed a lot too, which is this one. So that's occult stress urinary incontinence. And that means hidden. So a lot of times people that are um, showing up with prolapse and they have a lot of anterior vaginal wall prolapse, like if this is the bladder and here's the urethra, if the bladder is coming out of the vagina, the urethra is kink. And so they say, no, I don't leak if I cough, laugh, or sneeze. But as soon as you push the bulge back in and have them cough, they actually leak. So just something to always, you know, kind of be on the, on the lookout for. So you have to objectify uh, their voiding dysfunction. So the easy way to do that is with a post-void residual. So I pretty much do that with almost every patient in my office every day. So I'll have someone go to the bathroom and urinate. Obviously, not everybody, but most people. I'll have them go to the bathroom and urinate, and then we'll put a catheter in and see. And so we'll objectify um, their voiding dysfunction. A lot of people feel like they go to the bathroom and then they get done, they get up and they immediately have to go again. So they're saying, oh, I just, I'm not emptying well. And I'll put a catheter in and they'll have five milliliters after they void. And so it's probably just that they're having another bladder contraction directly after the void and making them feel like they have to go again. So, and then maybe you'll put a catheter in and there's a liter in there sometimes. And that obviously changes uh, how you would treat that patient. And then we're gonna talk about urodynamics in a little bit, but I really use this it's almost exclusively. Uh, like I probably only do two urodynamics a week, but I use this on a daily basis. So this is an eyeball filling study, also known as a simple systemetrogram, which is where you just take a, a red rubber, put it in the catheter, you can immediately or put it in the bladder, you can immediately measure a post void residual, and then you can put a 60 cc like slip tip syringe with the piston out of it, and then just start filling their bladder up and watch what it does. You can watch the meniscus as it rises or falls, if they have a bladder contraction will go up. And then you can take the catheter out, have them cough, and you can get a cough stress test. So I can get a lot of information out of this. And this is much more um, inexpensive than urodynamics and also, uh, I feel like, much more useful. You also want to do a good exam. So you just want to make sure you examine and palpate the anterior vaginal wall. And even the posterior vaginal wall can sometimes cause problems. And then obviously, don't forget about IC. I feel like so many times people come into my office and they're telling me what's going on and it's pain and they have urgency and frequency and it ends up being interstitial cystitis. And they've kind of been going around town seeing their family practice doctors, you know, internal medicine, they've been to the ER and even other OBGYNs and can't really figure out what's going on. So don't, don't forget about interstitial cystitis. So when you look at the spectrum of OAB and just urinary incontinence in general, um, mixed is in the middle here where you have both of it and then stress is over here, right? But, but you also will have stress if it's mixed and then urge will be right here. And then there's also overactive bladder, um, which is urge incontinence, but it can also be overactive bladder dry. So it means that they just have urgency frequency and they got to get up to go to the bathroom at night, but they don't leak. So there's really several different types that you can be on the lookout for. And then a bladder diary is a really easy way to objectify what's going on with a patient. I use this probably five or six times a day with pretty much with every new patient I send them home. And there's 24 rows for every hour of the day. Uh, there's only three categories here. So what are you drinking and how much? What are you, uh, as far as the urine, like how much are you making? How often are you going? And then any accidents, a so small, medium, large, are you having an urge, yes or no? And what are you doing? And I can really get a great idea of what's happening. And you don't need to do this for like a week or, I mean, this only needs to be three random days, they don't need to be consecutive. And this can really give you a great idea of what's happening. And it's also helpful for the patient too. So this is the eyeball filling study, or we just call it the simple systemetrogram. So just a red rubber in, here's your slip tip, 60 cc syringe, you just start pouring water in. And it's really great, people with IC, um, you know, if we're not sure what's going on, they'll have really low volumes of having a lot of pain and urgency. People with really bad overactive bladder as you're filling it and at low volumes, they'll say, oh, I have to go. And you watch the meniscus rise you'll say, oh, okay, yep, you do have OAB. And for people who complain of stress incontinence, this is the way I can do my cough stress test if they don't leak with a subjectively empty you know, supine cough stress test. So let's talk about overactive bladder first. So there are lines of therapy. So one, two, and three. So first, first line therapy is gonna be easy stuff that I do on a daily basis also. So lifestyle modifications. So I tell people to do time voiding. So there's really, we think a good, 
connection that can be kind of restored between the brain and the bladder. And by doing time voiding, so that would be setting an alarm on your phone um, to go off every hour and go to the bathroom every hour, no matter what, and just go during the day for an entire week. And then the next week you move it up 15 more minutes. So it'd be an hour and 15 minutes and you do that for a week and then an hour and 30 the next week. So you can kind of get back up to that, you know, two to three hour window that's much more convenient. Um, cutting out soda, coffee, I mean, we think is, is maybe helpful, but there's not really great data that it really is a bladder irritant. But the big thing we do know that fluid restrictions, so 64 ounces, which is about two liters a day, is, is helpful. I mean, I have people come in and on their bladder diary, they're drinking two liters of uh, it's like code red, you know, like the Mountain Dew. And I was like, well, that's why you get up at night so many times. So let's try, you know, let's try to cut that down. The other thing, if people have bad nocturia, would be um, to have them not drink anything four hours before they go to bed. And that really can help. Um, within first line therapy, you also have physical therapy. So pelvic floor physical therapy and behavioral therapy. This, I have seen this work just wonders. I mean, people have come back and said, I am completely cured. This is amazing. So doing lifestyle modifications, fluid restrictions and, and pelvic floor physical therapy, they're cured. But at the same time, some people come in and say it doesn't work at all. And that's okay. So then we can move to second line therapy. What's that? Oh, that's, that's an, sorry, an emergency alert from Tiger Tanks. Hold on. Oh. That's not an emergency. Can I take a break just for a split second? I'm really sorry. Almost done. Okay. Okay, so sorry. So let's talk about second line therapy. From So there are medications. There are two classes of medications that we have to treat overactive bladder. So there's anticholinergics, and these are the ones that you see on commercials all the time with the little bladders holding hands walking in the park. So this would be like Detrol, Ditropan, Toviaz, um, Sanctura. I mean, there's an enabler. There's, you know, there's about 14 of them. And then there's the beta-3 agonist. So for years, there's only been one, and it's called Mirbetric or Mirabegron. And there is a new one now called uh, Gimtesa. And so we're gonna talk about that in a little bit too. So if second line therapy doesn't work and I can you know, I try them on one medicine, it doesn't work. I try them on another medicine, it doesn't work. Then we can move here to third line therapy. So, and, and this is in no order, of course, but Botox injections into the bladder using hundred units actually works really, really well. Uh, I can do sacral neuromodulation, which is the inner stem. And we can do this, um, it's really the, the posterior tibial nerve stimulation, so PTNS. So behavioral therapy for OAB, we're going to go back to doing some easy stuff for a second. So really you can do some education reinforcement. What is it? What causes it? At least that we think delayed voiding, time voiding, get a bladder diary, fluid intake management, uh, again with time voiding, and then pelvic floor physical therapy, questionable biofeedback. There's not great data on biofeedback. Definitely on um, behavioral therapy though, works really well. So back to the meds again so these are our anticholinergics so you tried physical therapy you tried you know easy um low you know low risk stuff it doesn't work so you can try oxybutynin darafenacin solafenacin and we just named all these or you can do mirabegron and the new one that has just come out which is mirabegron i think uh, which is the gymtesa um so these are what you can try so let's talk about these anticholinergics cause dry eyes dry mouth and constipation they have been around a lot longer and they're usually um, more affordable. They have more side effects, so like I just talked about. And if someone is pretty well controlled on oxybutynin, like maybe five milligrams a day, but they, they keep coming in saying, I am just, the dry mouth is just awful, then maybe try the extended release version. So extended releases of all these actually have the same efficacy, but with lower side effect profiles. And then say um, someone is over 70, and we're going to get into this, you really should not be using anticholinergics, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, it's actually beginning to potentially be a contraindication if someone's over 70, or if they have um, things like gastroparesis or uh, closed or acute angle glaucoma, you cannot use these in these patients. So maybe you need to try Mirabegron or Gimtesa, the new one. Mirabegron has one contraindication, which is uncontrolled hypertension, which is, I think, the new one now. Gimtesa does not have that contraindication. So, and there's actually, I think, a third one that's on, on its way to come out. So hopefully these are going to be more affordable soon. Um, so third-line therapy, so Botox is injections through a cystoscope. And 
a long time ago, people would just put these injections. They, they do about 100 units spaced out over 20 injections or 10 injections, just kind of all over the bladder. But now we're really putting them like right here. So I kind of start at the trigone uh, above the ureter and I kind of go like this. So I do five, then five like this, five like that. And then I kind of do a few down in here because we think this is where all the nerves are coming. And then there's interstem, which is a great procedure also, which is nice because it's a stage procedure. So we put this little wire into S3 with a temporary lead hanging out that goes into a little fanny pack that they wear. And they go home for a week or two and they just kind of see what they do. And if they like it and we compare bladder diaries to before this to after and they've got a 50% improvement and they're happy, then we can take them back to the OR and put this battery in and the battery lasts five to seven years. There's some new updates with this as of um, the last time I gave this talk a few years ago. This lead is now MRI safe. Um, before you could not have an MRI with an interstim and now you can. And there's actually a new battery. This is the permanent battery that once it dies, you gotta go and have surgery, take it out and replace it. The new one now is like this, like it's tiny, um, probably a sixth of this size and it's rechargeable. So it can last much, much, much longer, but you gotta recharge it every week. And then posterior tibial nerve stimulation. This is really reserved for people who either can't have a procedure or a surgery. They have a lot of comorbidities um, and they can't, you know, I, it's just, they're not good surgical candidates. Well, they can come to my office every week for 12 weeks um, for 30 minute sessions like this lady here just sitting here reading a book. And then if it works for them after the 12 weeks and they're happy, then they would come in once a month for a 30 minute maintenance uh, treatment. So let's talk about stress urinary incontinence, so SUI. So similar to OAB, you're gonna do lifestyle and behavior modifications. I mean, obviously if you leak every time you cough, laugh, and sneeze, maybe emptying your bladder more often and trying to keep a, a, a smaller volume in your bladder may help. Physical therapy works really well for this because strengthening, because you know, stress urinary incontinence is a urethral problem. So that's the support under the urethra cannot hold the urine when you put stress on the in the abdominal cavity. Whereas overactive bladder is a nerve problem in the bladder. So by strengthening these muscles with pelvic floor physical therapy, it actually can help a lot. There's also a continence pessary. So it's like just like a normal support pessary that we'll talk about in a second too, but it has like a little knob on it that goes under the urethra to kind of compress it. And there's also something you can get on Amazon, you can get at CVS Walgreens. Uh, it's called the Impreza, it's made by Poise. And it's basically a tampon that's meant for stress and incontinence. Like I've got a lady who plays tennis and uh, it's, it's wild. She puts it in and she does not leak at all. But if she didn't wear it, she would leak every time she played tennis. Uh, a little bit more in depth, but still pretty uh, minimally invasive is urethral bulking. So that's through the cystoscope. We can put a needle and actually inject some collagen like material around the urethra to kind of give coaptation to the urethra to close it down. This works really well for people who have um, some contraindications to having a sling or bigger surgeries. And it also works really well for people with ISD, which is intrinsic sphincter deficiency, or just a very severe form of stress urinary incontinence. And then the gold standard, of course, is the mid urethral slings. Um, so the retropubic, the obturator, and the new kind of relatively new mini slings. Um, and this is mesh, but this is not the, uh, well, this is mesh, but it's not the mesh that, that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. And then of course, there's the pubovaginal fascial slings. Um, there's the first procedure uh, and then the MMK. And the MMK is not done anymore, uh, which probably would, uh, so. Apparently if someone, uh, unmuted themselves. <laughs> um, I'll have to check that. That'd be great. Marcy, is Marcy doing Marcy, if there's a Marcy out there, maybe try to unmute your screen again, please. Thanks. <laughs> um, as far as the midgerithal slings go and the pubovaginal slings, they work equally as well. Obviously, the pubovaginal sling has uh, a risk because it's an open procedure in the abdomen or to the leg. In the fascia lata. One second. Oh. <laughs> Can Marcy Dumaplin please mute your microphone? Mm -hmm. I gotta go, Mark. I'll see you. We could, we could air it. Air. Does anybody know Marcy's number? Bye -bye. You could call her. Here, I'll let you go. Sorry, guys. Technical difficulties here. Yeah.
go to the D's maybe. Yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, so the birch procedure works almost as well as the sling or the pubovaginal sling, but also still comes with a few more risks. Um, but overall, most of these work pretty well. Um, oh, there we go. So let's talk about pelvic organ prolapse. So this was a patient I had when uh, I was a third year resident. Uh, this lady came into the emergency room for altered mental status and had a creatinine of seven. So she was in an acute uh, kidney injury um, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. So the nurse went to go put a catheter in to get her up to the floor and they saw this and said, oh, we probably should call gynecology. And we put a pessary in her uh, just temporarily and her creatinine immediately started coming down and she got better. And we eventually took her back to do what's called a Lafort copoclasis, which we'll talk about in a second. But this was really my first kind of introduction into uh, prolapse. And I was just kind of fascinated by it. And that's probably why I'm standing right here today. Um, so this is the POP-Q. I know this, this looks intimidating for a lot of people, and it was for me too when I was a resident. I had, just had no idea, but it's actually really simple. And it's also very reproducible. And this is really the gold standard for report, reporting degrees of prolapse as opposed to the uh, more antiquated Baden-Walker term, which is the grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. So I could take a measurement here, 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 all these, and put it on my little grid and send it to someone anywhere in the world and they could look at the grid and get a really great idea of exactly what's going on in every compartment. So it's reproducible and it's, it's fairly easy to understand once you get it. Um, so there are really five things that you can do for pelvic organ prolapse. So because we talked about um, things like when someone comes into the office, you know, the first thing you wanna ask is what's bothering you the most? Well, maybe this isn't bothering them. Maybe it's just that they've noticed it. And so pelvic organ prolapse is not dangerous. Um, as long as you can empty your bladder and as long as your creatinine is not high and you're going into you know, kidney failure, but usually that's, that's very rare. Um, so doing nothing actually is very reasonable. Um, if someone has very advanced prolapse, like the picture that you saw, I probably would get a creatinine. Um, I probably would get a renal ultrasound and do a post-void residual just to make sure if they didn't want to do anything, just to kind of at least monitor, just to make sure they're okay. And then a gold standard here is pelvic floor physical therapy. Obviously, if someone has presidential, like in the picture we just saw, uh, it's probably not going to make that go back in. But for, you know, earlier stage prolapse, like, you know, where it's almost to the opening or a little bit to the opening or maybe just a little bit beyond, actually, it can actually um, work very well. So there's some data that says, and they use the Baden-Walker, like grade one, grade two, grade three. They found that 50% of women um, that did pelvic floor physical therapy can actually improve their stage by one. So that's pretty good. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but you're not out much if it doesn't. Medicine is really more a theoretical um, treatment for pelvic organ prolapse. So one thing that you could do would be like vaginal estrogen cream. There is no data to say that that helps, but anecdotally, I have found that patients say, I actually feel like my prolapse is better. And maybe it's because the estrogen is helping the muscles have some tone. Maybe them just they're feeling better overall. Um, maybe they have the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, like the dryness, the, you know, all the stuff that comes from the atrophy, so the irritation, and maybe that's helping. So I don't know, but there's no data on this to say it's going to help. And then the two really things that are really widely used to actually kind of treat it would be a pessary, which we'll talk about in a second, and then surgery. So these are the millions of pessaries that they have. Um, really the, there we go. The main pessary that I use is this one. So this is a ring with support. Um, this is the most commonly used pessary. And then the secondly, or second most common is the Gellhorn. So if I try someone with a ring and usually a number four or number five, it's gonna be your most common sizes. So if you really could pick one or two, it's probably a number four or number five. If this doesn't work, um, then maybe try a Gellhorn. And I see a lot of people that have Gellhorns that have been to other people that have managed. And they say it's so hard to get out. Maybe try using a single tooth tenaculum to grab right here. And it makes it just a lot easier for you to kind of manipulate it when you're doing your changes. But any generalist should be able to manage pessaries, put these in, take them out. I mean, I, I usually will do a pessary fitting. I'll see someone back in two weeks. Uh, I'll take the, the pessary out and then we'll look for the speculum and make sure there's not any erosions, uh, bleeding or any problems like that. And then if they're going to manage it themselves, like taking it out at least once a week, I'll have them come back um, in three months and we'll do the exact same thing again. If um, they're doing well at three months, then I'll do six months. And then if they're doing well at six months, then I can just start seeing them yearly as long as they're managing themselves. For the, the patients where they do not want to manage it themselves, and I do, then I just see them every three months, take it out, clean it, do a speculum exam, and put it back in. 
So let's talk about routes of hysterectomy. So I think I showed you guys this, I, for some of you who didn't see this uh, when I gave this talk a few years ago, this is data up to 2013. So in 2000, 65% uh, of hysterectomies were done as an open uh, route. And then with the advent of the robot in 2005, we have started seeing that the robot has been steadily increasing. So up to 2013, 33% of uh, hysterectomies are now done robotically. And it's nice that straight stick laparoscopy also has had a steady increase. But the thing that makes me, I don't know why, is that vaginal hysterectomy has been lowered and lowered. And we really thought that maybe it was around 14%, but it's probably much lower. So here's some some similar data right here. So this is gonna say 8% in 2013, and we think that it's even lower than that now. So why is that? I don't know. I think you know the robot makes things easy, but there is very, very, very clear data from the Cochrane. Um, there from, I think Chris Mayer did that one. I think there is data from the committee opinions, from the practice bulletins, that vaginal hysterectomy should be the route of choice when feasible, uh, all the time. And that straight stick laparoscopy may offer some advantages, like when you just cannot get the uterus out, or if they have some type of pathology in the anexo, or if they're BRCA, and you got to take their ovaries out for sure, maybe. But, but the value of operative laparoscopy also goes down with careless use of disposables. So trying to use things like the Roby, which is a, a great little monopolar device. And it's similar to the robot. It has monopolar scissors and a bipolar grasper but they're reusable. Instead of dropping $700 every time you use a ligature, maybe ask for the Roby. So, you know, value, when we talk about routes of hysterectomy, value is really a quotient of the, the cost of the hysterectomy relative to the outcomes. And the outcomes of vaginal hysterectomy are always better. Operative time, blood loss, recovery. And when you also look at cost, the vaginal hysterectomy is the, it should be the route of choice. So this is what we were talking about here. So ACOG, so evidence demonstrates that in general, vaginal hysterectomy is associated with better outcomes, fewer complications than laparoscopic or abdominal hysterectomy. The, the recent Cochrane that came out said the same thing. And it said that laparoscopic may offer a few advantages occasionally. It said that um, thankfully open is, is kind of going by the wayside, hopefully. And then it said that the robot actually should be abandoned for general gynecology. I know that's a, a very bold statement that they made, but they have not been able to find any reason to say, yeah, it's good. Um, now in other, other fields of medicine, so like oncology, um, urology and others, I mean, sure, there is good data for the robot, but for general gynecology, we should really be trying to get everything out vaginally or at, at minimum, you know, with a straight stick. So the, the and, I, and I, I'm not trying to say that the robot is bad. I, I, I'm here standing in front of you today because of the robot. So when I was a medical student, it was one of the very first surgeries I ever saw, and I was blown away by this thing. Uh, it is a, just an, an amazing piece of technology, and I still think it's amazing. Um, but, you know, to do this, to do a hysterectomy, and the cost that this takes, and the amount of personnel in the room, and the devices, and the disposable things, I mean, this is what you need for a vaginal hysterectomy. And, you know, and granted, I am probably a little biased on this because this is how I trained in Cincinnati. We did probably 99.9% .9 of hysterectomies vaginally. And I've, I've only done one non-vaginal hysterectomy since I've been here. But like I said, I'm biased because a lot of my patients have prolapse and it's a little bit easier to do a vag hiss. But I also have had some patients with abnormal uterine bleeding with a small vaginal caliber and not a whole lot of uterine dehiscence. And we've still been able to get it out vaginally. So I would just say, you know, give it a try again. Um, so, you know, people say, oh, well, I can't, I can't take this out vaginally for sure. Well, there are some reasons where you can't. So in a completely immobile uterus, I mean, there've been, there's been a few patients that I've had even since I've been in attending where I'm just like, this, this is not coming out vaginally. Okay, that's fine. Um, concurrent adnexal masses like we talked about or, or recent definitely have to come out or some known pelvic adhesive device, like you read an optimal, the poster cul-de-sac is just completely socked in. That may be dangerous to make a colpotomy at that point, you know, blindly and you may get a bowel injury. Um, but, you know, even a really large uterus I mean, in Cincinnati, when I was in training, I mean, we, we took out some humongous, humongous specimens uh, through the vagina. So it can be done. So things that are really not contraindications, so like I said, uterine size, you know, oh, they've had a C-section. Well, I mean, I've done four and five C-sections and it's been fine. Uh, lack of uterine descent. I mean, I had a lady uh, a few months ago and her TVL was 12 and her C was 11, which means it didn't move much. Um, and we got it out 
um, and then previous history of PID, they go for it. So another very important thing to do that, that all gynecologists should be doing, and this is also based off of very clear data, is that we should be preserving level one support at the time of hysterectomy to avoid post-hysterectomy prolapse. Um, it keeps me in business if you guys don't, but you know you really should be doing this for your patients. It is very, very important. So you guys have all heard of John Delancey up in Michigan. He's kind of one of the grandfathers of urogynecology. He has the three levels of support. So as you can see here, the uh, uterus sacral cardinal ligament complex and, and along with the um, sacrospinous ligament are all considered level one support. So this is the most important part. So like if you do prolapse surgery on somebody, and you just do an anterior repair, you're probably doing them a disservice by not doing some type of a ball suspension accommodation. And then you have the level two support. So this is gonna be your anterior repair, your post posterior repair, and then your perineoplasty, which would be the level three. So these are in you know descending order here of importance. So level one is the most important Thing that you can do for somebody. So at minimum, you know, if, if you do a hysterectomy, you should do something to support the cuff of the vagina back into the uterus sacral ligaments. And an easy thing to do is a McCall's. And what most people probably do is what's called a modified McCall's. Um, this is a great and easy thing to do. Um, you can also do a uterus sacral ligament suspension. So if you're doing a straight stick case like a TLH, you can tie the ligaments into the cuff. Um, it doesn't take much longer. And then one nice thing about this, and I just want to get to this part right here. Um, you can bill this as an intraperitoneal copoplexy when you do this, because you are doing it. You're, you're suspending the vagina and it doesn't take much longer. So you get paid, but the big important part is the patient doesn't have to under, or at least is less likely to undergo another surgery for prolapse in the future. So this really should be done. And there's great data to support this. So everybody's, I'm sure everybody's seen a McCall's photoplasty on how to do this. So this is the open cuff right here. And here's the uterosacral ligaments. So one stitch is gonna go from the vaginal epithelium into the abdominal cavity through the peritoneum, go through one uterosacral ligament and then reef the peritoneum, go back through uterosacral ligament out, and then just kind of tag these with a hemostat. Go ahead and finish closing your cuff and then tie this knot down. Now in, in Traditionally, a McCall's is all internal. So these would be like internal stitches right here. And this is actually tied through uh, the anterior serosa of the rectum or you know, uh, the distal sigmoid. But really don't do these anymore. And you can actually do two rows of this. And this doesn't take long to do. I mean, you, I, I just put cokers right here and then just kind of pull out. It's pretty, you have your assistant with the retractor and it's actually pretty straightforward. And when you tie this knot down, once the cuff is closed, you can see that the cuff actually goes back up pretty well. And it gives great support. And so here's what one looks like um, after a hysterectomy and after a uterosacral ligament suspension. Um, so you can see how the uterosacrals now are tied in tightly. They're basically shortened up into the vaginal cuff. So this lady's gonna have great support. So let's talk about some controversies and updates um, for urodynamics. So I do not really feel like urodynamics is needed in the vast majority of patients. So many people um, have do your dynamics and feel like it's necessary for everybody, especially your, you know, 38 year old that's had four kids that has had no surgeries and leaks a little bit when she coughs, laughs, and sneezes and all that things. You, you don't need to do that. We're going to talk about this in a second. And then mesh augmentation, sling selection for SUI patients, use of energy sources in the vaginal canal, and risk of dementia with antibiotics, as well as antibiotic selection for spraying UTIs. I do okay on time, by the way. Okay. So like I said, I don't think urodynamics is needed for every single patient. Like I said, I, I probably do urodynamics twice a week. And these are usually on people that have had multiple pelvic reconstructive surgeries with, with some pretty objectified voiding dysfunction. Um, and I usually combine that with a cystoscopy because I'm, we're usually planning surgery and I don't really like having surprises in the OR, so I don't want to know what we're doing. But it really needs to be tailored to the patient's complaints. So like I said, if someone comes in and they're you know young and they've had no surgeries and they leak a little bit when they cough, laugh, and sneeze, you do not need complex you know, multi-channel urodynamics, just an easy eyeball filling study, a post-void residual, a cough stress test, and urinalysis, and you can take them to the OR. These urethral function tests, like the maximum urethral closure pressure, I did three years of fellowship and lots of urodynamics, and we never did a single one of these. This has really gone by the wayside and really more now for just kind of something done in the history that we still get tested on on the boards, but it doesn't give you any more information. Like if they leak, they need a slam. You know, I mean, it's just, I, I don't know why we need to do that. So this eyeball study is really all you need to do. And the other thing is that your dynamics is so artificial, right? I mean, there's a cartoon with this lady who's got kind of a gown on and she's standing there and she's got catheters coming out of the vagina or bladder and there's all these doctors in white coats standing around her and she's having your dynamics. They're like, okay, now try to urinate. It's hard. It's an artificial environment. You're not going to get, 
I don't know. I think the utility of urodynamics is very limited. It is useful in very select few patients, and it does give you good information for those, but I just don't think it's needed for everybody. Um, so the most recent Cochrane review that came out for mesh augmentation, now this is the vaginal mesh. This is the stuff that's in the lawsuits. This is the stuff that actually got banned in 2019. So this is anterior and posterior mesh, either synthetic or biologic. And the FDA said, no more of these. You cannot do it anymore. Um, they're all off the market. So posterior vaginal mesh, no, you should never be doing that. that is, there's, there's good data for that. Anterior vaginal mesh, granted, all of the kits you know, that made these are off the market. There may be a time where you still could put in some anterior vaginal mesh. I, I haven't done it yet, but I'm sure in my future, I'm probably like, I had a lady with, um, she has Ehlers-Danlos type three and she had procedentia at age 26 and she had a hysterectomy and then her prolapse got bad because she didn't have any other prolapse repair at that time. And then she had an anterior and posterior repair. And again, it failed. So she came to see me, I took her and did a laparoscopic sacred pulpoplexy and it's holding as of right now, and this was two years ago, but if she comes back and she fails anteriorly, I, I probably, and I've had this talk with her, we, we may, she may be my first patient that may actually benefit from anterior vaginal mesh, but I take a lot of mesh out from this stuff and it, it, it worked really well, but it had a lot of problems. And then the indications for sacred pulpoplexy also are very controversial. Um, when we go to the AUGS meetings, Iuga, Suku, all, all, all the ones, I mean, one of the biggest controversies is like the people that are hardcore sacrocobal pexy for every single patient are the people that are really saying you should do native tissue repair, you know, with a sacrospinous or uterus sacral every time. So this is, this is a big, a big thing. So this is not the best cartoon, but you can see laying from the side, the surgeon has a finger in the vagina and then the top of the vagina is sewn with mesh going to uh, the anterior longitudinal ligament right here. So this is L5, here's S1. And at the drop-off is where we sew this. And then another piece of mesh. And the newer ones now is like a Y. So this is one piece of mesh and then it kind of Ys out this way anteriorly and posteriorly. Um, and, and this the surgery, you know, it, it does work really well, but it also comes with problems. I mean, I did one yesterday, but I don't do them that often. I feel like I am very, very more apt to tell someone that they, if they got a good tissue repair with their own tissue using a uterosacral ligament suspension or sacrospinous suspension, the worst thing that happens is the prolapse comes back. But with a sacral copalpexy, if something goes wrong, um, the mesh exposure, you know, the mesh can go into the bowel, it can erode into the bladder, it can get into the ureters. I mean, it, chances are it won't, but it can. And I think that sacral copalpexy or any mesh, it doesn't just like the risk of having a problem doesn't kind of go up right after surgery and then it plateaus as you have it. I think that the longer you have it in, the more chance something bad could happen. So I have a talk with my patients about this and like, you know, should we do a sacral copalpexy or should we do native tissue? Native tissue repairs are going to fail 20% of the time, according to data. Um, I don't see that as much, but like I, that's what the data says. And then a sacral copalpexy may fail 10% of the time, maybe 15, depending on which, which uh, literature you actually read. So is the, you know, five to 10% difference worth the risk of a, a much bigger surgery um, and having a large piece of mesh in your abdomen for the rest of your life? I don't know. And this, this is, like I said, this is a highly debated topic. Um, when you look at native tissue repair, if it fails, it's associated with an increased awareness of prolapse, like recurrence and increased risk of repeat surgery for prolapse. And recurrence of the anterior compartment uh, prolapse is really kind of where it most happens compared with the polypropylene mesh report. However, so that, so that kind of makes you think, oh, well, we should be doing sacred propylpexy. But if you think about native tissue repair overall was reduced with or was associated with reduced risk of de novo SUI. So that means people that didn't leak when they cough, laugh, and sneeze, they're going to have more of that new onset of that if you have a sacred propylpexy um, versus if you had a native tissue repair, you're going to have reduced bladder injury reduced rates of prolapse and stress urinary incontinence and mesh exposure surgery overall. So the overall amount of repeat surgeries are lower with native tissue, but with native tissue, your repeat surgery for prolapse recurrence is gonna be higher. So these are all just, there's no right answer right now. There's no recommendations that we should be doing sacral copalpexy as a sentinel prolapse surgery every time. There's not. So I still do a lot of native tissue repair. Um, so like I said, I mean, this is kind of, I, I think that the majority of people can be managed with transvaginal with native tissue repairs. But like, I mean, I did a sacral copalpexy yesterday and that's what she wanted. And so that's what we did, but okay. Um, there, there's also some great, great, great new data coming out on uterine preservation. So I've probably done 
maybe 10 of these now in my two years here. So these are women who have pretty significant prolapse but have no contraindications to keeping their uterus. So their paps have always been normal, they've never had those cause of bleeding, cancer or anything like that. So I'll do a uterine surgery to, or uterine uh, preservation surgery called a hysteropexy. And in Cincinnati, we used to do uterosacral hysteropexies. Um, and there is better data on sacrospinous hysteropexy. So I actually have started changing and I've done, I think five of them now. And there, this is based on Kate Merriweather, who's a, um, a lady out of Louisville, who is, I think she just left Louisville, but she wrote this huge systematic review on uterine preservation. So there's not a lot of great data on it yet, but the data that we do have looks pretty good. And then there was an article out of BMJ, um, I think last year, and they randomized 200 women to either getting a vag cyst with uterosacral suspension anterior and posterior repair or a sacral spinous hysteropexy with anterior and posterior repair. And the women that got the hysteropexy actually did better. I think only one person out of the 100 had a, a recurrence versus seven in the uterosacral suspension with vag cyst. So I'm doing more of them and I have patients asking for it. And it's, a, it's an elegant procedure. It's easy, it's fast, and the morbidity and mortality is much less. So um, so sling selection, when I gave this talk two years ago, I, I said that there is no difference between a retropubic and a um, transopterator. And based on the Thomas trial, which is the biggest trial looking at these two, th there is no difference really. I mean, technically retropubic is a little bit better when you look at raw numbers, but there was no statistically significant difference. Um, and I said, you know, there's really no difference. If you're really good at TOTs, do them. If you're really good at TBTs, do them. Um, and then I, I said that if someone had ISD, so intrinsic sphincter deficiency, you probably should be doing a retropubic as opposed to a transoperator. But there's been some new data lately that's looked at people having ISD and TOTs and they're doing just as well. So maybe it's even more right that there really is no right answer between slings. So whichever one you get trained on, whichever one you're good at, so I mean, the risk or benefits of both, and then they kind of, they're about the same. Um, really, the only time that you should ever put a retropubic in somebody versus a transoperator is if someone has had a previous sling, um, whether it's retropubic or transoperator, you probably should always put a retropubic in over it. You probably should never put a TOT over any other sling. Um, the role of autologous slings, so I, I don't do these very often, uh, but that would be like a fascia lata sling or a rectus fascia sling. And I do these for people who have failed slings, litigious patients who do not want mesh, um, or for someone who I'm doing a urethral reconstruction on, like if they've got a diverticulum, but they also have stress and conics and want that fixed at the same time, you would never put a mesh sling over a urethral reconstruction because it will erode right through. Uh, but I don't, so I don't do these very often. Uh, bulking agents, so that's the, like what we talked about where you put a camera in the urethra and then a needle can kind of inject. These are great for people who uh, cannot have a big surgery or for people with like a severe form of stress and conics, like the ISD, this works pretty well. Um, so again, I mean, just, I think sling selection is kind of going by the wayside. It's like I said, I think whatever you're good at, it's probably okay. Um, we used to think that severity of SUI and ISD pretty much always determined that you would get a retropubic, but now it's saying that TOT is probably going to be fine. Um, and you know, urethral mobility, like doing the, the Q-tip test, I, I, all, all three years of fellowship, we never did that a single time. I mean, basically, if they leak, you know, when you fill them up and they empty their bladder room, they can get a sling. You don't need to do the. Um, obviously, age, body habits, and comorbidities kind of change things. And so uh, some people do the mini slings for people who are extremely obese, where the TDP needles or the TOT needles are just not going to be able to exit the skin because the patient is so large. So that may be some new things. And there's data looking at mini slings right now. Um, there's a, a head to head study currently looking at TVT to mini sling. It's a multi center study, and we'll probably have those results soon. And they're going to follow, follow those patients and reevaluate it five years. So let's talk about energy sources uh, in the vagina. So there's the fractional CO2 laser that everybody's heard of called the Mona Lisa. Um, it, is, it is a really great device. Um, and then there's the, the one that, I, that we also looked at um, in Cincinnati called the Candela Core 2. Um, this is really used for genital syndrome of, or genital urinary syndrome and menopause. And then there have been some studies and we were participating in studies for lichen sclerosis too on the outside, like hitting up the fractional laser of the Mona Lisa. Um, there's also radio frequency devices and these things are on the forefront, but they're really only research right now. So if someone's advertising that they can do this in their office, I, I don't, I just, I'm not really sure yet about that because there's, there's really no good data to support these yet. But we think that kind of using this radio frequency to almost like 
burn and fibrose the tissues under the urethra can kind of help with stress and incontinence. So it's kind of like putting a sling in, but we found him when we were doing these studies in Cincinnati that these women with mixed incontinence said, man, my overactive bladder is gone. So maybe melting these nerves, because the, that's where the nerves of the bladder come in anyway. So I don't know. So these are some things that are happening soon and there's going to be more data out on it. Um, but the vaginal tightening and the vaginal rejuvenation, like that's just not a thing with that. And as a matter of fact, um, an ACOG practice bulletin from August of 2019, actually, I think it was in July, but the, but the statement came out in August, um, was that vaginal carbon dioxide CO2 fractional lasers for the treatment of dyspareunia that's due to genitourinary syndrome menopause should not be used outside of a research study. So that's, that was very unfortunate because this is right when I got to Cincinnati or right when I got to Erlanger and we have a, um, a Mona Lisa touch here and I used it all through fellowship and I thought I was getting good results with patients and they liked it, but this is saying we should not be using it. It didn't say maybe not, it said should not be used outside of research. So I've got a device that cost $100,000, I guess, that came over with uh, you know one of my other partners and I'm not using it. So maybe data will come out soon and says, okay, it is fine. But as of right now, I'm, I'm not doing it. Um, this is a, a big deal right here. And I feel like I had most questions um, after my talk uh, to a couple years ago on this. So right when I finished fellowship, there was a new warning that came out. So um, Mark Walters from Cleveland Clinic uh, put an AUGS consensus, consensus statement together saying that recently there's been some concerns about anticholinergic medications and the risk of early onset Alzheimer's and dementia. And so it said, you really should be using the lowest dose for the lowest amount of time and try to find alternative medicines. And then there was a recent JAMA article uh, not long after that, that found a 1.65 odds ratio. So you're 1.65 more times likely to get early onset Alzheimer's and dementia if you use some type of anticholinergic daily for three years or more. And in the beers list, if you guys are familiar with the beers list, which is all the medications that are for you know the older patients, um, this is also in there, but also Benadryl is in there. So these women that be, are taking, you know, Tylenol PM every night for years and years, maybe it's the Benadryl that's causing this, or these people that are, lots of people are on anticholinergics. So this was two years ago. And then Mark Walters actually just, I think it's right here. Yeah. So Mark Walters just updated this consen consensus statement. Um, let's see. I don't know, half a year ago. And he said that OAB medicines, so anticholinergics specifically, should not be used in women's older, or women older than 70. So that's kind of a big deal too, because I've got a lot of women that I put overactive bladder medicine, or at least anticholinergics on. And so this is, this is really limiting how we can treat. And thankfully there are new medicines coming out, the beta-3 agonists. So we're really using those. And like I said, the you know, Mirbetric was, has been the only one and it's just, it's, it's never covered. It's always $300 a month for patients. Um, and I can't give it to anybody with, um, you know, uncontrolled hypertension, but this new one, this Gymtessa, it looks like it does not have these type of contraindications with high blood pressure. So that is promising new stuff. And then the last, the last thing I just want to talk about. So IDSA was the Infectious Disease Society of America. And this Thomas Hooten is really the, the guru of UTIs and how to treat it. And so for uncomplicated UTIs, I see people all the time that get Cipro or they get amoxicillin or something for a UTI. You really should only be using three. Unless there's a contraindication to it, you should be using macrobid, sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim, which is Bactrim DS, or fosfamycin, also called monurol. These are the only three you should be using for simple, uncomplicated UTIs. That's it. You, you should not be using, Cipro works really, really well for UTIs, but Thomas Hooten, who's an ID guy, and he is amazing on all of his papers, he says it works really great. It, it really does, but it, we're really worried we're going to start getting resistance to us. That's one of our big guns that we would give for complicated UTIs. Cipro really should, for any type of urinary tract infection, should only be used for pylo, not for UTIs. So you can use Keflex and some other beta lactams. Like, so say someone is, has a GFR of 32. You can't give macrobid to someone with a GFR under 40. And I think actually, I think it used to be 30, but I think they've just upped it to 40 now. And it's not that it's not gonna, like it's gonna hurt them. It's just not gonna work. Okay, so if it's not filtering, because macrobid only works in the urine anyway, when it gets, it gets activated as a bacteriostatic once it hits urine. Say they have a sulfa allergy, okay? Or say phosphomycin, which is one of my favorite antibiotics in the world because you just take this little packet and you pour it into the water. It's three grams. I drink it one time and it's done. That's it. One time treatment. 
but so many pharmacies don't have it and it's kind of expensive, but these are the only three you should be using. So say they can't get covered, they have a sulfa allergy and say their GFR is 32, what do you do next? Well, probably Keflex. The only time you should be using it, amoxicillin and ampicillin should never be used for UTI and less of, you know, like it's absolutely GBS. Okay, those are almost always widely susceptible to, you know, some type of a penicillin. So maybe, but Hooten says they should never be used and says should not be used. And like I said, if someone's got pylo, yeah, send them home on Cipro. If they don't have pylo, please don't send them home on Cipro because that's really one of our great big guns that we got left and we're really trying to watch out for uh, resistance. So that is my talk. Um, I guess we're going to open up the... Marty has any question? I know, right? I don't know. Just <laughs> one cheesy last thing to put on there. <laughs> good. Okay. Um, how do we do the question stuff? If they have questions, we'll type them into the chat. Oh, we'll type them in. Okay. Well, hopefully that was helpful. Just kind of an overview of. Here's all the stuff. Okay. Oh, how do I do this little thing here? Oh, this is, names, so oh, this is it from the very beginning. Oh. Yeah, yeah. oh boy, there's a lot of stuff here. Yeah. Let's go Just down here. Take it the bottom key. So oh. here's one for Tom Voiding. What time window do you start the patients at? Okay, so great. Yeah, great question. So I have to ask them. I'm like, one of my important questions that I ask is like, if you leak, you know, how often and then how often do you have to go to the bathroom during the day? Is it every 30 minutes? Is it 45 minutes every hour? Can you make it two or three hours? And if they say, oh, I can make it, you know, usually an hour to hour and a half. Well, I would probably start them at 45 minutes. That's when I would go. Um, and then I would move it up by 15 minutes every time after that. Now, if someone says, oh, I can usually make it, you know, an hour and a half, well, then I would probably start at an hour and a half, usually just when they can make it, or maybe 15 minutes before, and then have them do that for the, uh, the first week. So good question. You speak so highly of pelvic floor physical therapy. Great. Do you have a standard time frame? Yeah. Okay. So good question here too. So if I see somebody and I give them all the options, you could do nothing, you could do physical therapy, we could do a pessary, this is for prolapse, just I'll start with that one, or you know, we could do surgery. And for OAB, I'm like, well, we could do fluid management and just see that for, you know, a couple of weeks, or we could maybe do fluid management and pelvic floor physical therapy. If they say they want to do physical therapy, I send the referral in and then I see them back in two months. And sometimes I start them on an anticholinergic or a beta-3 agonist at the same time, and that gives me enough time to see if the medicine is going to kick in, the pelvic floor is going to kick in. And I think having a kind of the synergy of all of these you know, treatments together, I, I find that it helps a lot. So I usually do two month follow up after PT. It also takes about that long for them to get in and then follow up, do it, and then be done and come back and see them. Good question. Uh, it looks like that's that so far. I would like to receive these slides as well. Can, can people get these slides? Great talk for us journalists, Arvin. Oh, yeah. Marcy said thank you. Not sure why we need that. Three new messages. I said, is there a connection between the two? Uh, M. Jackson, can you tell me uh, what two you're talking about? Sorry. And apparently Anne Marie Anglum and Sydney and Meg are here. Forgot to sign them in, but they're here. Right. Uh, overactive bladder. Okay. So is there a connection between overactive bladder and prolapse? I actually wrote a paper. I wrote a paper on that. Um, we don't know. Maybe. Um, I tell you, I, I see it hand in hand all the time. Um, it just, we don't really know. So one way to find out maybe would be to put a pessary in somebody and send them home for a few weeks and see if their overactive bladder gets better with a pessary in. 
if it's fixing the prolapse. You know, there's a theory that maybe that as the prolapse is happening, that the nerves are being stretched and it's causing some overactive bladder. And so maybe that's what, maybe that works. And every once in a while, after I do surgery on somebody, I, they come in and they say, I, they don't get up at night anymore. They're not having to rush to the bathroom. So maybe there is a connection, but we've also found in other studies that there's not a connection. And not everybody that I do prolapse surgery on has their overactive bladder corrected. Like I said, anatomical correction is not always going to fix the you know, regular function. Uh, do you find, oh, hold on. Do you find compliance with pelvic floor physical therapy is an issue when you send patients for it? No, the benchmark uh, is who I use a lot. And for more difficult patients, I send them like people who are gonna require a little bit more, I'll send them to uh, Melissa Kubik, or, uh, Aaron Schinkel, who are just two really fantastic. Uh, Chances weight is also really good. And there's, there's multiple other that I'm sure I'm forgetting, but uh, these are all the, uh, I don't find that compliance is a problem. I, these, these pelvic floor physical therapy companies reach out. Um, they set up the appointments. Not everybody gives it the full try. Like they try it once and say it didn't work, but I really tell them, you got to give it the, you got to give it the few weeks, please, you know, and really try to do what they say. Um, it seems, it seems to work. I, I mean, like I said, I have people come in and they're like, I'm cured. That's it. It's pretty, pretty great, but it doesn't work for everybody. Okay. And, you know, if you guys have any other questions um, like in the future, you can always email me. Uh, it's carson.kaser at erlanger.org. Uh, or if, if I know you, you know, you can always text me or call me, of course. Okay. All right. Anything else? That's it. All right. Thanks, guys. We will take a five minute break and then come back for the next speakers.